We're going to commence the gospel meeting this afternoon with the first hymn on our sheet. I hear the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find me in thine all in all. Now we'll just take time to sing verses 1 and 3 of our first hymn. to try a verse of the second hymn on our sheet. <clears throat> Are you walking daily by the Saviour's side? Verse 2 it is. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Verse 2 and the chorus of our second hymn on the sheet. Are you walking daily by the Saviour's side? sheet. We're going to sing verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read the first verse. Many are happy in Jesus today. Why not you? Why not you? Sure of a home in the mansions of light. Why not you? Verses 3 and 4 of the third hymn on our sheet. Many a prodigal child has returned. Why not you? Just before we pray, I think it's only but right to announce that <clears throat> there is a funeral.
taking place at this same moment in time up the street, uh, Mr. William Shields, and we will be remembering that family in prayer. William Shields was very helpful to us whenever we tried to build the Gospel Hall at Ballykeel, and we could never forget this encouragement, and we're very sorry to hear that William passed away on Friday. Then also, Melvin Carser, he come every Sunday that he could to these meetings, and he was buried on Monday past, and it would be good to remember the Carson family in Newcastle in prayer as well. The last day Mr. Carson was in Kilkeel High School, going out the door he reached me a Bible, and he said, Jonathan, I want you to keep that and use it in personal work. I didn't realise he was going to be taken home to glory so soon. Also, before I pray, I'll mention those in the district that are not well. Adam Barber's father's not well. Clive McCullough, Sylvia McCandless, Bob Barber. And we're encouraged to hear that William Shields' grandson, Alfie, has made a good improvement. And Jim McNew has made an improvement. And we also mention today our brother, Mr. William Bingham, the minister of Mourn Presbyterian. I got a message yesterday again from him, and he said that he's red flagged for an operation this week, and also he has tests this week. So we pray that they'll have the operation this week, and we pray that they'll have all the tests. And we are looking to God to bring our brother through, who's a much needed man in this area. Now we're going to pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we bow again and we come to thee through the precious and worthy name of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to give thee thanks for the blessings of another day, for health and strength and soundness of mind, for journey and mercies on dangerous roads. We're thankful that we're still in the day of grace and sinners can still hear the gospel message. We come to thank thee for the Lord Jesus. The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. We thank thee that he was the sent one and the sinless one. And he went to Calvary and he became the suffering one. And there on Calvary's cross he took my place. We sung it this morning already. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. We praise thee today that the work is done, the blood is shed, and all the requirements have been met, and the Saviour died and was buried, and God has raised him from the dead. We thank thee for a living Saviour, and we just pray now that as Christ is uplifted once more on the pole of the gospel, that our brother will have help to do it, and that thou wilt draw sinners to Christ today. And we pray that this meeting will prove to be a blessing to at least one soul. We do pray for our brother Michael. Give him help, guidance, wisdom. Make it easy for him to speak. Bring to mind that which thou would have him say. Protect him today from saying that which is not of thyself. Protect us from the power of Satan today. Overthrow his power. And we pray that the Spirit of God will work amongst us and that sinners will be convicted and conversion will be wrought in these cars. Do remember those in sickness. We think of all these names that we have mentioned. We pray for each one of these individuals. We pray for those in sorrow. Comfort families in sorrow today and strengthen those in sickness and bring them through. Lord, there's more names that we have missed out today, but we pray thy blessing upon every family that is passing through deep waters at this time. We leave our meeting now with thee. We pray for help and blessing, and we ask all in the Lord's name. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I would like to announce that next Lord's Day there's another meeting, same time, and I'm going to try and preach a wee word in the gospel next Lord's Day afternoon. And then I would mention the Sunday after that, our brother Tom Armstrong from Dariake is coming here to preach the gospel. He's going to be here and then he's going to leave us 
and travel to the other. He's taking a two-hour journey to preach somewhere else as well. So we do leave these announcements. We make them subject to the mind and to the will of God. None of us knows what a day may bring forth. Now we introduce our brother Michael and Michael's going to come forward and make the gospel known again. And we trust that if you're not saved, that this will be the afternoon that you'll receive Christ as your own and personal saviour. Without any further ado, we hand the meeting over to our brother Michael. Our reading this afternoon will be from John's Gospel, please, and chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse number 5 says, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, know not whither, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That will be our reading this afternoon from the Word of God. Each one of us, on a daily basis, we take journeys. In fact, you have made a journey to be here this afternoon at Riverside, and we're, we're thankful that you have taken that journey. Shortly when this meeting comes to a close, you again will take a journey, and each one of us will go our various ways to our homes or to wherever we are headed. I wonder if I were to ask you this afternoon, could you tell me what is the greatest journey that you've ever heard of, I wonder how you would respond. Perhaps you would say to me, well, I wonder was it when that expedition made its journey to the South Pole? That was a tremendous journey. They endured great hardship and danger as they arrived at the Pole. Maybe you would say to me, well, perhaps could it be in that journey in 1953 when Edmund Hillary planted that flag on the summit of Mount Everest. An incredible journey. Great hardship. Great danger. Maybe you say to me, well, no, how about the first journey into space? Indeed, this very month, we've been thinking of the 60th anniversary. The 60th anniversary of when Yuri Gargarin orbited the Earth for 108 minutes, the first space flight. Maybe you think to me that is the greatest journey. This afternoon, in the back of my Bible, perhaps the same as your Bible, there are maps, maps of countries, plans of cities, but also in my Bible there are a few maps and they mark out journeys. And one such example would be Paul's missionary journeys. And in my Bible, there's Paul's first journey and his second journey and his third journey. And it's very interesting to look at those. When he endured great hardship to bring the message of the gospel to many people. But also in the back of my Bible is another map. And the title written across that map is Journey of the Saviour, the journeys of the Saviour. And friend, I would suggest to you this afternoon that that is the greatest journey that has ever taken place. And not only that, but that is the greatest journey that will ever take place. Because you see, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, he came from heaven. And he left the glories of heaven and he came down into this world. Why did he come? He came out of love. The Father sent the Son. The God of heaven sent his only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. For God so loved the world that he gave. And in our Bible we can read much concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and we can read much concerning his journey. We read of where he was born. No room for him in the inn. He was born there in the stable and laid in the manger. 
we read a little concerning his early life, but not so much. And then, as it were, things go quite quiet, and we, we don't read very much about him for perhaps some almost 30 years. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, he embarks on his, as it were, his public ministry. And then we start to read examples of miracles that he performed. We, we read of people he came into contact with. We read of messages that he delivered as he journeyed on. And all the while, dear friend, his journey was leading him to the place called Calvary. Because you see, that is why the Lord Jesus Christ actually journeyed from heaven into this world. His purpose in coming was to go to a cross and to die on a cross. And maybe you said to me this afternoon, well, why, why did he die on a cross? Well, perhaps I should say, first of all, this person that I'm talking to you about this afternoon, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was absolutely perfect. He was totally sinless. And yet we read in our Bible how that he was delivered to be crucified. And we read these words, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. So you say if this person was perfect and if this person was sinless, why was he being crucified? And perhaps you would say, well, what does it mean to be crucified? Well, really in Bible times, people were crucified, people were put to death, people were punished for crimes that they had committed. But the Lord Jesus Christ had committed no crimes. So there on the cross at Calvary, dear friend, he was crucified for you and for me. Yes, for you and for me. You and I who have sinned. You and I who have done wrong. You and I who have turned our back on God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loved me so much loves you so much that he willingly went to the cross at Calvary and there he voluntarily laid down his life for you. Listen to what our Bible tells us concerning that. It says this, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. What a journey to leave heaven and to come into this world knowing that one day you would go to a cross and on that cross you would be punished by God for the sin of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ, he died on the cross. He lay down his life. His body was taken down off the cross. It was laid in the new tomb. But thankfully this afternoon we're not here to tell you of someone who is dead. But we're here to tell you of someone who rose from the dead. One who defeated death. But more than that, dear friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he journeyed from heaven. He journeyed to Calvary. But dear friend, he journeyed back to heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, he ascended back to heaven. He could leave these words. He could say, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Dear friend, this afternoon I would suggest to you, the journey that the Lord Jesus Christ has taken is the greatest journey this world has ever known. Behind me, for those cars who are immediately in front of me, behind me you will notice a chart. It's called the Two Roads Chart. And it's really this chart that has been upon my mind as I've thought of this afternoon's Gospel meeting. This chart depicts, as it were, what happens to a soul when a person dies. There are two roads, as the title would suggest. In Matthew chapter 7, you can read of these two roads. There is a broad road, 
and it says the destination for the broad road is its destruction, ultimately hell and the lake of fire. It also depicts a narrow road, a narrow road which leads to life, and its ultimate destination is heaven. There are only two roads. There are only two destinies. It's either heaven or hell. And so could I just ask you this afternoon, dear friend, what road are you on? On the journey of life, are you on the broad road? Or are you on the narrow road? Last Sunday afternoon, if you were here, we were told an illustration, and I'm going to tell it to you again. For I've thought about it much this past week. Albert Einstein was on a train. He was making a journey from Princeton, and the conductor came walking through the train carriage to ask to see the passengers' tickets. The conductor came to Albert Einstein, and he couldn't find his ticket, and he looked in his pockets, and he searched his pockets. He couldn't find it, and he got quite perplexed, quite confused by this, annoyed by this. And the conductor said to him, recognizing him, he said, Mr. Mr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. The conductor made his way through the carriage, and just as he left the carriage to close the door, he looked back, and that intelligent man was down on his hands and knees on the floor of the carriage, searching for his missing ticket. The conductor turned and he walked back down through the carriage and he said, Mr. Einstein, he says, don't worry. He says, I know who you are. It is reported that Einstein turned to him and he said, I too know who I am. But listen, friend, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going, dear friend, do you know where you're going? Yesterday afternoon, Sharon and I were walking in the Mourne Mountains. We were up near the Windy Gap. We were having a cup of tea and another couple came walking up and we got chatting to them and they asked us directions. And so we took a map out of our rucksack and we told them they needed to follow a path up and they would go to a, a stile. And then we told them they needed to head up over Pigeon Rock and then walk down and, and catch the Mourn Wall and if they followed the Mourn Wall that would bring them back to the road and if they got to the road they could walk down the road and get to where their car was parked. We parted company, they headed off, I, I hope they found their car. Sharon and I, we put them up in our rucksack and we started up the mountain but we didn't end up where we thought we were going. You say, how come? You had a map in your rucksack. You told someone else where to go. And you didn't end up where you thought you were going. No. You know why? Because we thought we knew the way. We thought we knew the way. I, I wonder, people, am I talking to anyone this afternoon? And if someone were to ask you how they could get to heaven, you could maybe tell them and tell them far better than I could how they could be in heaven. I wonder, are you heading for heaven yourself? Remember the chart behind me, two roads, a broad road which leads to destruction and a narrow road which leads to life. Could it be this afternoon, friend, that the choice you make or could I put it another way, the decision you make will determine where you will spend eternity or where you will be for eternity. Maybe you say to me, well, can you tell me, are there any people in the Bible? Are there any people in the Bible who are on the broad road? Can you give us some examples? Well, if we go right to the very start of our Bible in Genesis chapter 13, we read there of a man called Lot. And he was faced with, a, with a, a choice. He was on a journey with another man called Abraham. And they decided they would part and go their separate ways. And Abraham said to Lot to 
decide which direction he wanted to go. And Lot looked at what lay before him. He looked at the land and it says he saw the well-watered plain of Jordan. And it says he journeyed east. Lot made his choice and he journeyed in a certain direction. He went after what was attractive to his eyes and sadly for Lot his life, his life as it were, it spiraled down and down. His life was wrecked by sin. His family was devastated by sin. He was on the broad road, the broad road which leads to destruction. You say, well, that's the way at the start of your Bible. What about a little later on in your Bible? Well, if we were to move over into the New Testament, in Luke's Gospel in chapter 15, we read there of a young person, and they lived at home, and they decided they would like to get away from home, and they would like to live their own life, and they would like to get away from maybe the constraints of living at home. And so the young fellow, he went to his dad, and he said, he asked his father if he would give him some money. And his father did this. And it says, the young lad, he made his journey to the far country. You say, well, he went and he made a fresh start. He went and he lived his own life. He went and he put down his own roots. Dear friends, he went and he had great friends. And he had great fun. But you know, there came a point where the friends left him. There came a point where the fun ended and he was alone and he was in need and he was in want. You see, dear friend, sin will bring pleasure in the short term, but it won't last. The young lad, he was on the broad road and it ends in destruction. Dear friend, you're maybe here this afternoon and you would like to, as a door, go your own way. Could I tell you there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. But I don't want to leave the story there. Bad enough to talk about the broad way, but what about the narrow way? That same young lad, there comes a point in his life when he realizes this is hopeless. There's no hope for me. So what does he do? He comes to this point. He says, I have sin." You say, what was significant about that? He realized he had done wrong. He realized he had sinned against God and he said he would go to his father. And so he makes him about turning his heads home. And you say to me, well, what sort of welcome did he get? Was he chased by his father? Was he scolded by his father? Not a bit of it. It says, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He was welcomed home with open arms. What did the young lad say? He said, Father, I have sinned, listen, against heaven and before thee. Dear friend, maybe this afternoon you have sinned. I don't know what you have done. I don't need to know what you've done. Indeed, I don't care what you've done. If you would repent of your sins and turn to Christ, I know for a fact you will be welcomed. Because the Lord Jesus Christ himself could say, he could say, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Another example would be when the Lord Jesus Christ was being crucified at Calvary, there was two thieves with him and one of the thieves beside the Lord Jesus, a man who was being put to death for what we would term armed robbery. He turned to the Lord Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He realized that he was being put to death for the wrongs that he had committed. But he realized that the Lord Jesus Christ had done no wrong. You say, what did the Lord Jesus say to him? Did he tell him he needed to start again? Did he tell him he had done wrong? No, the Lord Jesus just turned to him and he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Dear friend here this afternoon at Riverside, if you could only get to Christ, you would leave the broad road. You would start on the narrow road, which leads to heaven. A family were going on their holidays and they came in the car to a sign which was blocking the road and it said, danger, road closed, do not enter. The father skirted around the sign because he knew the way. And he continued for many miles on that road. There were no offshoots. There were no side roads. He kept going. 
He was quite pleased with himself. He was quite smug. He had beaten the system. And as he traveled on, he suddenly came face to face with a bridge. Sorry, he came face to face where, where a bridge should have been. One choice, plunge on disaster. No bridge, he would have plunged into the water below. The only choice he had was to turn around. And so he turned around and he backtracked and he backtracked. He wasn't so smug now. He wasn't so full of himself. He knew he had made a mistake. And when he came back to where the big sign was, danger, road closed, no entry. On the back of the sign, the workmen had written these words, welcome back. Dear friend, this afternoon you maybe have turned your back on God. You have maybe rejected his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It matters not. This afternoon, if you would but trust him, if you would but repent of your sin and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you could be saved and you could start on the journey to heaven. Just as I would finish, all our journeys are different, but they have similarities. They have a start point. Each of us are on a journey and it's going in the wrong direction when we were born. But one other thing about our journey, it will have an end. It will have an end. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah addressed the king one day and he asked him for leave of absence to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And the, the king granted him his request. But the king asked him a question, for how long will thy journey be? Dear friend, could I ask you this afternoon, how long will your journey be? Maybe you say, I intend to be in heaven. How long will your journey be? First Samuel reminds us clearly that there is but a step between thee and death. Proverbs 27 reminds us, thou knowest not what shall be on the morrow. James 4 reminds us, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Dear friend, for how long shall thy journey be? Moses once there in the book of Numbers, as he led out the children of Israel, he said these words, he said, we are journeying onto a place which the Lord has said. We are journeying onto a place which the Lord has said. Come now with us. Dear friend, there's an old hymn we sometimes sing it. We're traveling home to heaven above. Will you go? Will you go? We have thought this afternoon of some journeys. The greatest journey ever taken by the Lord Jesus Christ. We have thought of, thought of the journey of life. We're going in the wrong direction. Two roads. The narrow way and the broad way. Where are you going, friend? As you drive up the avenue, you'll come to the T-junction. You'll take left for on along. You'll take right for Kilkey. I trust when you come to that T-junction, I trust that you'll have made the right choice. You'll have chosen Christ. For dear friend, if you miss Christ, you'll miss heaven. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all who have been at our meeting this afternoon. We ask for thy blessing upon what has been said and of thyself. Take each to their homes in safety as we ask all returning thanks in our Lord's name. Amen. Friends, could I just say one thing as I finish? Last Sunday afternoon, Thomas Wallace made a comment and I have thought about it all week. He said, how does the Lord Jesus Christ know the way? How does the Lord Jesus Christ know the way? He answered it, he said, because he is the way. I am the way. Thank you.